Uh, can you hear me well? Yes? I can hear you, yes. yes? Okay. So, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here uh, in the second international event organized by Mark Science and Technology Study Group, which is a group affiliated with uh, Ciencia Studio Philosophical Association. And uh, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss the labor theory of value, and we are going to count on the contributions of these two uh, professors, Professor Pocock Schott, who is a retired reader at the University of Glasgow. He's a computer scientist and, and uh, an economist, and uh, has, worked in, has worked in both areas. Uh, he's actually the second time here with us. The first time was last year in a debate talking about socialist calculation, and it was a really interesting debate. And uh, we have as well Professor Marcos Barbosa de Oliveira, who is someone that we know really well because he's one of the founders of this group, actually, the Smart Science and Technology Study Group. So thank you twice for being the, the, one of the founders and be here with us. And uh, let me say just a little, uh, uh, some few words about this topic. Like, even though we can trace back this subject, this labor theory, uh, labor theory of value, to the 17th century, Adam Smith and others, uh, this kind of discussion is still something really interesting for nowadays, because if you take into account the, the kind of situation we have in Brazil, many of the economists we have in government and so on, they try to implement policies denying or accepting some of the concepts that we are going to listen in this lecture. So it's not something old to discuss, it's something that brings some benefits for today's, uh, you know, for, the, for today's discussions in Brazil as well. So uh, I would like to thank you, uh, all of you that came here, all of the people that's watching us uh, through uh, streaming, transmission on in the internet, and I would like to thank all the uh, staff here of the Institute of Advanced Studies. So, uh, without no further ado, I will invite Professor Pocock Schott to start, and after we are going to have Marx and our uh, debate. Um, I, I'm going to try and switch through to a uh, full screen. Can you tell me whether you, you're getting my screen? Okay, thanks. Okay. I'm, I'll, I'll skip on uh, to, to the first slide or so. Um, I'm going to say, what does what the labor theory of value actually tell you as an empirical proposition? Well, in the form given by the classical economists, it was that the average prices of goods will be proportional to the average amount of labor used to make them. And when you convert that into the type of analysis that Marx was concerned with, which was the process of value adding, in industry and the share of that value adding which went as profit and uh, the share of value added that went as wages, what it says is that the value added in industry will be roughly proportional to the labor it uses and in consequence price quantities are indirect representations of underlying quantities of human time and when you look at monetary flows of goods you're actually seeing a projection of something that exists behind that. You're seeing the projection onto the field of money of the underlying social division of labor. Now, almost as soon as Ricardo came up with this theory, it started to be used by socialist opponents of capitalism uh, well before Marx. And it was seen as a dangerous doctrine. So conservative economists attacked it in several ways. One of them was an attack on, along the lines that prices re represent subjective valuations. This, in a more sophisticated form, was cast as saying supply and demand curves determine prices. I've got a separate uh, video and talks I've given on, on the, the weakness of that theory. But the 
within more recent uh, criticisms of it, uh, you get the criticisms by Samuelson, etc., where he held that the labor theory of value was inconsistent due to the transformation problem and that uh, it led to contradictory results and should therefore be discarded. Now, those were entirely theoretical arguments. None of those arguments by conservative economists actually relied on any econometric data. And a scientific theory, if it's scientific, has to be one that's capable of making predictions which can be put to observational tests. If you've got a theory of price which makes no testable predictions about the actual structure of prices, it, it will be meaningless. And if you can't test it, it's not scientific. If it is testable, and if its predictions are borne out by observation, then it should be accepted. Now, what about the, the labor theory of value? Is it testable? Are its predictions borne out by observation? Well, how would we test it? To verify it, you need information on the money value of output of lots of industries and the labor content of the outputs of these industries. And if the money value is very closely correlated with the labor content, then the predictions of the labor theory of value are confirmed. Because, of course, the classical economists like Smith and Ricardo didn't claim that prices were exactly proportional to labor content. They said the mean price, the expected value of the price in modern terms, would be proportional to, to the average labor content. So they allowed for the fact that there would be dispersion around the mean. Now, can you get that information? Yes, you can nowadays. You can since Leontief invented the input-output table. And these input-output tables are published for most economies, for most large economies. And you can use them to compute the direct and indirect uh, labor usage in, e in any given economy for each industrial output. What you find when you do that is that the money value of output and the labor used directly and indirectly to produce it correlate extremely closely. This is just a, a scatter plot I've produced for recent data from the, the UK economy, uh, person years along the x-axis. Uh, millions of pounds along the y-axis, and you can see a clear linear relationship exists there. There are some outliers. These two outliers here are oil production and oil refining. Now, both of those are industries which, according to the Ricardian theory of rent, would be expected to sell their product at, the, at above the average labor content. Because according to the Ricardian theory of rent, anything which is either agricultural or mineral production will be governed by a marginal cost pricing or marginal labor content uh, pricing uh, mechanism. So all of this is entirely what you'd expect from the Ricardian theory. When you look at other countries, you get similar results. I, I've cited the uh, the sources for these, but the, you, there are a lot more than these have been published, but this is just a sample of, of major economies, and we see that in general, the correlations are above 94%. In many cases, the correlations are, are 97, 98%. Japan, the correlation between price and labor content in 1995 was 98.6% extremely strong correlations. If you're looking at any other area of economics and you had correlations of that uh, strength, you would be overjoyed. Now, what about the transformation problem? This was, or what's now called the transformation problem, was 
seen as one of the weaknesses of Ricardo's theory. He'd not only assumed that labour content will determine prices, but also claim that the rate of profit in all industries will tend to equalize. Now, Ricardo did some quite sophisticated calculations to show that the expected divergence in prices from labour values due to this is only about 7% or so. Um, but the, potentially there is a, a contradiction here because if profit comes from labour, Labour intensive industries should have a higher rate of profit, thus contradicting uh, Ricardo's second assumption. On the other hand, if we assume that labour intensive industries have the same rate of profit as capital intensive industries, then the, the selling prices must diverge from labour values. Now, as I say, Ricardo reckoned that the divergence might be about 7%. Uh, and in some ways, the empirical data seems to back him up. But in the 19th century, this was seen a serious flaw in his theory and helped to discredit it. Marx had a procedure which he claimed would transform labor values into profit rate, into profit equalizing prices. But from the late 19th century on, an apparent logical flaw was found in this because his examples didn't transform the um, the values of means of production into to prices of production and uh, Sraffa showed that if you simply um, assume profit equalizing prices and have a exact material description of what goes into production, the profit equalizing prices are themselves enough to determine, along with the real wage, the expected prices of output. And this was the reason Samuel Anderson said, well, it shows the labor theory of value is redundant, and that all you need to do to transform labor values into prices is to take a rubber and erase all references to labor from Marx's argument. But until the 1990s, nobody really tested to see whether profit equalizing prices or labor values were closer. Once people started looking at it, it soon became clear that profit equalizing prices are not better than labor values in predicting real prices. Uh, David Zachariah, has done the most comprehensive study of this of all the OECD nations, and the study shows that some in some countries labor values give a better prediction of prices. In other countries, production uh, prices of production give a better prediction, but there's no clear advantage of one of one versus the other. Why is this? Well, the thing, there are three key pieces of evidence that you have to look at in assessing whether the labor theory of value is right. The first, a strong correlation between money value and labor content. Secondly, to see whether you get that strong correlation, whatever input you use, because some people say it's just the fact that big industries employ a lot of workers, and big industries have a large um, labor, uh, sorry, large value, money value output. The test will be to see if you take, for example, rubber use or electricity use, you would expect a big industry to use a lot of electricity and to have a big uh, money value. So how well do those correlate? And the, the third piece of evidence, which I think is decisive for the labor theory of value, is that in fact the rates of profit are lower in capital intensive industries than they are in labor intensive industries. It's very hard to see any reason why that should be the case if it wasn't the case that labor was the source of value. Well, here I'm just reproducing some of the figures I had before, so I'll skip over that. Other value bases. 
you can use you can compute a Leontiev inverse for any of the inputs that goes into production. And you can then correlate um, the extent to which final prices correlate with agricultural inputs, for example. And in Sweden, um, Zachariah showed there's only a 19% correlation between final prices and agricultural inputs, whereas there's a 96% for labor. And for all the inputs, there's a poor co much poorer correlation. The only ones which come close to it are energy. Energy gives 73% correlation. Still a lot worse than labor, but better than agricultural input. Now, in a sense, that's not all that surprising, since the main purpose of energy input, electricity input, is to replace human labor with artificial power. You can look at this visually. These are plots. Can people see these clearly? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a plot of that I showed you before. There's the labor value, the, the labor content a, a, against money price. This big scatter here is the squares are iron and steel. The star, the diamonds are electricity. The the crosses are computer inputs, and you can see these are scattered much worse. Now I pro projected it on a a log scale, which makes the correlation look better for these other industries than on a linear scale. If you look on a linear scale, the correlation is terrible. Um, now, look, the next point, it, well, the general argument there is it cannot be the case that just the size of the industry is what ex is explaining the, the correlation. Because if it was size, that would apply to any input. But of course, there's no sense in which you can colloquially talk about a size of an industry in a way that's independent of the number of people it employs. We talk about an industry being a big industry if it employs lots of people. Uh, so we, our terminology for size already incorporates the idea that labor is the source. Now, this is the, the critical piece of evidence. Whichever country you look at, this is the case of Sweden, the x-axis is what Marx calls the organic composition of capital, or the capital-to-wage ratio. The y-axis is the profit rate, and you see that profit rates are very strongly negatively correlated with organic composition of capital. If Ricardo was right and Marx's volume three was right, everything would be clustered along that horizontal line. It's not. It's clustered along this line, which is the line you'd predict from volume one of capital. It's not just Sweden. Uh, here's the USA data that I and Alan Cottrell prepared. Again, you see it's much more closely explained, the data is much better explained by the theory in volume one of capital, which says it should fall along this line, than the theory in volume three of capital, which says it should fall along that line. So, on the basis of the empirical data, there was no need for Marx to transform labor values into prices of production, since market prices seem to be governed by labor values not by prices of production. The profit rate doesn't equalize. It has some random dispersion, uh, but the assumption of the transformation problem is that profits are uncorrelated with capital composition. The idea was that even allowing for random dispersion, you'd expect a high organic composition of capital industry to earn the same profit as a low organic composition of capital industry. In fact, the opposite is the case. The more capital intensive an industry is, the lower its rate of profit. And how can you explain that? 
unless it's actually labor that is the source of value. Now, econometric studies have shown that the labor theory of value is true, but why is it true? Now, I think the answer was provided by Fajun and Makova in their book, The Laws of Chaos. And basically, they gave a statistical argument for it. Um, here's an axis. The x-axis is going to represent price to labor ratio. The y-axis is the likelihood of it occurring. So this is probabilities, and this is a variable they called psi which is the price over integrated wages, where the integrated wages are the direct and indirect wages paid to make something. And they say you expect to get a normal distribution here. Well, this is the mean price to, uh, to, to integrated wage ratio, and you expect it to be normal because it's a sum of many independent causes. And any process, which is the sum of many independent causes, assumes the shape of a normal distribution. And they assume a mean of 1.5. Sorry, we are assuming a mean of 1.5. They assume a larger mean than that. Mean of 1.5 is what I found, we empirically found for Britain. Now, this shaded area is the zone of bankruptcy. If a firm is trading at a price to integrated wage ratio below one, it's selling its output below the cost of wages, let alone below the cost of all the raw materials. So it's a very unlikely situation to occur. Only a very small proportion of industries can be operating in that zone at any given time. Now, how does that help you? Well, Suppose in this diagram that I, I say only 5% of industries can be in this position. Less than 5% of industries can be in the position that they have a selling price which is less than their labor costs. Well, just standard... Statistics and the properties of the normal distribution tell you how that will compress the, the standard dis distribution. It says that the ratio that two standard deviations from the mean represents a ratio of a half. Prices are 1.5, so the 0.5 is, is two standard deviations on that distribution. Now, Fajun and Makova assumed stricter figures. They assumed that it would there'd be a three standard de deviation, uh, three standard deviations from the mean to the the, the one place, because they said it. They they said the probability of an industry operating with a price less than its wage bill was much less than five percent. Now. The point about this is that purely from statistical arguments like that, you can deduce what the degree of correlation ought to be between prices and labor contents. Just from the, the necessary coefficient of variation which you can deduce from those arguments about the normal distribution, you can derive what the correlations ought to be. And his, his data for Japan, uh, plotted by Sakuraya, comparing it with Fajun and Makova's prediction, and it's very close. It's, it's the, the distribution you actually observe is very close to the one they predict. In fact, they somewhat overestimate the share of profits in national income. Uh, they assume that profits will be 50% of national income. If profits are less than that, you, you end up with a more squashed distribution and an even closer correlation between 
labor values and prices. Now, this is a great example of modern Marxist science. Firstly, it uses methods from physics and statistics. It uses methods of uh, you know, arguments from the properties of statistical distributions, makes prior quantitative predictions. It allows empirical testing. When you do the empirical test, it's verified by the test. Now, the point is, I say, it makes prior predictions. They published their book in 1984 before anyone had done any of the empirical studies of the correlations between labor values and prices. And they made these predictions. They made these predictions from statistical arguments. And when the tests were done, their predictions turned out to be right. In fact, predictions turned out to be even, the actual correlations turned out to be even closer because they had overestimated the share of, of profit in national income. So the basic, basic hypothesis of the labor theory of value is strongly borne out. The value of the output of an industry is 95% determined by the direct and indirect labor used to produce it. The, only 5% of the variation or less than 5% of the variation is caused by um, random supply and demand factors or, or degrees of monopoly. The old argument by the socialist economists from Gray to Marx that profit is based on the exploitation of labor is empirically justified. There is no way that you could get the negative correlation between capital composition and rate of profit if capital itself was a source of value. It's because only labor is a source of value that you get that negative correlation. And it follows from that that labor theory of value should be the basis on which all socialist economics proceeds. Okay, I'm going to switch off this sharing. I can hear you again. I can hear you. Can't see you, but I can hear you. So, uh, good morning, everybody who is here and those people watching at the internet. I've already said good afternoon to Professor Paul, and uh, I'd like to say at the beginning that it's a pleasure for me to be here exchanging some ideas uh, with him. Well, my English is a bit rusty, so I've written down the comments I had to make, and so I'll read them for you. Is that okay? In order to make clear the sense of my comments on Cockshot's talk, I will first say that last year we, I mean, the Marx Science and Technology Study Group had discussions about the Marx and labor theory of value in connection with a reading of capital. The position I defended in those discussions was critical of Marx theory on the grounds that it is unacceptable for being plagued by unsurmountable contradictions and paradoxes. Part of my arguments in favor of that thesis was taken from Bambaverk's criticisms of Marx's labor theory in his book, Marx and the Close of His System, in the English translation. In that book, the criticism of Marx's theory comes associated with the defense of the utility or subjective theory of value supported by the neoclassical tradition in economics. As regards this second element of his views, I don't follow Bembaver. Instead of advocating the subjective one, my position is that no theory of value is necessary, that economics can develop the knowledge it is expected to provide without any theory of value. One argument in favor of that thesis, I take him from from, um, from Polanyi, Karl Polanyi's uh, work, 
which I admire very much, uh, especially his uh, The Great Transformation. Now, I take this to be a very interesting book in economics, and if I'm not mistaken, it doesn't rely, it doesn't use any theory of value, neither the labor theory nor the subjective theory of value. However, a more elaborated defense of that view would depend on um, Well, I'll come back to that point later, sorry. Now, one crucial component of Ben Baver's critique, which I've incorporated in my views, is the proposition that in the capitalist system, there is a permanent tendency of the rate of profit to equalize, to become the same in all sectors of the economy. The proposition is supported by the functioning of a sort of feedback mechanism. If, at a certain moment, in time, the rate of profit in a sector is greater than the average. It will attract investments, which will increase the supply of commodities, making their prices go down, and in consequence, also the rate of profit, which will tend to the average. The argument, without going into details, is that Marx's labor theory is inconsistent with that proposition. According to it, the rate of profit would not be equal, but higher in sectors with low organic composition of capital, lower in sectors with higher organic composition. Or conversely, in other words, if the rates of profit are equal, then the law of value does not hold. The prices of commodities are not proportional to the amount of work employed in their production. In order to salvage Marx theory, the most common strategy among Marxists consists in maintaining the theory only at a very high level of abstraction, a strategy that, in my opinion, reduces drastically its explanatory power. What I find original and highly interesting in Cockshot's approach is that it is quite different from that attempt to formulate a theory that avoids the conflict with the profit equalizing proposition. As we have seen in his talk, he rejects the proposition on the basis of empirical evidence. Later on, I will ask a couple of questions about Cockshot's argument in favor of that rejection. At the moment, I will go back to my, main, to my, my claim that economics can do without any theory of value. In order to discuss claims of that sort, what is needed is a conception of economics, a meta-scientific account that establishes its ontological, epistemological, and methodological principles and demonstrates its worth as knowledge understood as an end in self or a source of impractical implications and applications or both. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Cockshot's arguments is implicitly based on the thesis that economics, from all those points of view, is no different from the natural sciences. That's where my disagreement starts. As regards the relationship between natural and social sciences, I am a follower of the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, who argues that there are essential differences between the two major areas of knowledge. One of the main differences, according to him, is that the theory in the social sciences may transform the reality to which it refers. Theories in natural sciences may transform reality, but only by means of its applications, and the transformation does not affect the laws contained in the theory on which the application is based. The movements of the planets in the solar systems were not at all affected by the development of Newtonian mechanics. In the social sciences, on the other hand, theories may affect the reality it refers to just by being accepted by some people. Adam Smith's theory of capitalism had an impact 
on the way the system develops. One can say, therefore, that in the natural sciences there is a separation between the subject and the object of thought, which does not hold in the social sciences. That's why the history of economic formations cannot be studied separately from economic theories. One facet of that situation is that it leaves the field open for self-fulfilling and self-defeating predictions. For instance, if the prediction that the rate of inflation will rise in a country is disclosed, it may prompt the producers to raise the price of their commodities as a hedge thus making the prediction come true. Now, if that process, if that sort of process occurs, I think it's obvious that the predictions lose their power as evidence capable of confirming or disconfirming a theory. Cockshot's vindication of the labor theory is grounded on the claim that it leads to correct predictions about the prices of commodities. My first question then is, would you, Paul, say that those predictions are free from the possibility of being either self-fulfilling or self-defeating? Coming back to my claim that economics can do without the theory of value, one way of refuting it would consist in showing directly its worth, in the present case, the worth of the labor theory. That's what Marx does while arguing, not of course against the thesis of the unnecessity of the, the, of the theory of value, but against previous theories by Smith and Ricardo. The main argument in defense of his theory is that he has the advantage of exposing the exploitation of the workers by capitalists by means of the extraction or extraction of surplus value. His book, Capital, It's Worthwhile to Observe, is not only a critique of political economy, as the subtitle says, but a critique of the capitalism, capitalist system itself. But Marx was not alone in that position, and there were in his time, there was in his time no lack of other critics of capitalism. Some of those criticisms were regarded by Marx as insufficiently radical, in the sense of leaving open the possibility of improving capitalism and thus making it acceptable by means of reforms. In my interpretation, Marx's main motivation to develop his labor theory was a goal of devising a radical critique according to which only the extinction of capitalism can free society from its ills. The way to achieve this aim is to present the relationship between capitalists and workers as the defining characteristic of the capitalist system and denouncing it as essentially exploitative and hence ethically unacceptable. The axiological principle involved in the, is the one that says that the worker is the is owner of the product of his labor. The fact that the capitalist is the sole owner of the commodities its companies produces, his company produces, amounts thus to a robbery of the surplus value. What I propose to do now is to suggest an alternative critique also axiological, but grounded in a different ethical principle. The critique, which is very forceful in our neoliberal times, is also present in Cockshot's views, refers to the inequality of the, distri the distribution of property and income which capitalism promotes. The ethical principle involved is a condemnation of gross inequalities in the distribution as socially unjust, a view that is widely shared, there being strong arguments in its favor. The question that presents itself is thus, in the present world situation, from the point of view of anti-capitalists, in which category I include myself, which critique is stronger, more likely to become a motor of change on 
the one on the basis of the labor theory of value focused on exploitation or the one based on capitalism's tendency to promote inequalities. The two critiques are not, of course, uh, are not, of course, mutually exclusive. For those like Oxshott who subscribe both critiques, my question then is, what does the labor theory critique adds to the one based on inequality in the distribution of property and income that capitalism promotes? Well, to conclude my remarks, just a couple of questions. A question, as I said before, uh, more specifically focused on Cockshot's exposition. Uh, I must say I'm not an economist, so maybe my questions are due only to my ignorance. But just two simple questions. First, in your account, how is the determination of the value of labor uh, established? I mean, this uh, input-output tables, I mean, what counts as the input? Uh, well, supposed to be labor, but labor measured in what way? Just by the salaries of the workers or the sort of hours of work that they contribute to the production of commodities? And the second question may be related to that one is the following. It's based on the view that uh, in discussions about labor theory, one uh, issue that comes up is the possibly different values of uh, the work of uh, skilled and unskilled workers. In practical terms, the question would be, is the hours of labor of a, a doctor or medical doctor the same uh, as that of a nurse, or is the work of an architect value at the same rate of, uh, as the work of a builder or a bricklayer? Uh, does that sort of issue come up in your theory in any way? So um, that's what I, my comments were, and uh, thank you for your attention. We can start with the questions that were addressed okay. to Paul. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to apologize. I won't have quite as much time as I thought because I'm going to have to take my son to the doctors. But let's, I'll, I'll try and answer those questions okay. as fast as I can. Yep. Um, the issue of whether social science is fundamentally different. Well, the labor theory of value was published – by Smith a long time ago, more more than um, 250 years ago now, I think. And the in that time, I see no evidence that the its publication as a scientific theory has had any effect of stopping prices being proportional to labor values. I, I agree there are sort of hypothetical circumstances in which information can produce big changes. But there are also hypothetical circumstances where people talk about the fluttering of a butterfly's wing um, changing the weather two months hence. Um, if you have chaotic systems which are very sensitive to initial conditions, a small change can produce a big result. But only certain systems are like that. I see no reason to... To, I see no evidence that knowing of the labor theory of value would stop it working. Uh, it, it's in, that seems to me entirely hypothetical, uh, and I don't see that it's happening. Um, on whether or not you need a theory of value, well, in one sense, if you don't want to investigate something, you don't need a theory of it. If, if you do want to investigate it, if you do want to in, investigate prices, uh, you need a theory of what prices, causes prices. 
if you do want to investigate the ratio relationship between wages and profits, you need a theory of it. Um, and the labor theory of value gives you an accurate theory of that. Now, not everyone is concerned about the relationship between wages and profits, but a very large number of people are. A very large number of people depend on their living for receiving wages, and another group of people depend on, for their wealth on wages being held down. So the, this touches on, on matters which have great import for society. I mean, Ricardo said the task of political economy was to investigate the laws which govern the distribution of income between the classes of society. And the classes in society are interested in the distribution of income. And the position of Marxists is that the working class can form a better understanding of their interests if they understand the mechanisms which govern their incomes. And that uh, although publishing these mechanisms may not be advantageous to those on property income, publishing these mechanisms is advantageous to those on wage income. So I'm in favor of it being promulgated. Um, the Bombave criticism was obviously one which I devoted some attention to. You have to realize it was just a hypothesis that profit rates would equalize. And it's a hypothesis that prices would be proportional to labor values. And those are two conflicting hypotheses. But when you have conflicting hypotheses, you have to see which one is true. And it turns out that the prices proportional to labor values is true and profit rate equalizing is false. Now, the profit equalizing story sounded plausible, but I think it's actually based on the illusions which arise in the stock market. In the stock market, it appears that the rate of return on capital in different industries is very similar. But that is brought about by movements in share prices, so that the apparent rate of return on a share invested in different industries will um, be very similar. But that's achieved by marking up or marking down the share prices. It's not the same as the real rate of return on the invested capital. And it's an illusion engendered by the stock market that real capital is transferable. You can't really transfer capital invested in railways into the production of sewing machines. The capital invested in railways is in the form of tracks, bridges, etc. And they're there and are not mobile. Um, and one of the clearest examples of this tendency for the highly capital intensive industries to have a low rate of return was the the dreadfully low rates of return on 19th century railway industry. That was the highest capital intensive industry and had the lowest rate of return and you couldn't get your capital out of it. You could attempt to sell your shares, but your shares wouldn't be worth anything. So the capital wasn't actually mobile out of these industries. So, uh I guess we can uh, have uh, another other questions here with the audience and uh, or even Marcus, if it, you you are pleased to do this. I have a question. Uh, <laughs> like uh, when I saw your slides, Paul, I saw that uh, the the countries that you you were analyzing the I/O table. They, they seem to be really rich countries, uh, like compared with other countries like Brazil and uh, South America countries. And I wondered uh, if you tried to find these correlations uh, in poor countries, and uh, if you well, didn't, yeah. how 
do you think it would be uh, in our situation? The only um, country th th that I, I've looked at that isn't OECD top ranking was Mexico. Correlations were just as strong for Mexico. Um, but assuming the Brazilian I.O. tables are, are available to you, you should easily be able to t do the calculations yourself. I, I think it may well be the case that um, Zachariah's database includes Brazil. I mean, I have been – he has about 30 different countries he's got data on. I, I obviously couldn't present 30 different countries, so I just selected some from each author. Okay. If you ask us in Portuguese, também a gente pode traduzir para o povo. I'm I'm just telling them uh, that we can translate Portuguese questions as well. <laughs> yes, I guess Paul has to go uh, in some place. So I guess that's it for today. Maybe, Paul, uh, we are going to keep discussing. Uh, maybe we can discuss here in Portuguese a little bit more. And after sure. we, we keep talking, we keep trying to make contact with you and organizing other events. For sure, we have lots of... Uh, interesting debates and uh, I think some of the developments of this lecture will be trying to find out some of this data in Brazil for example the Zio table in Brazil that may be something interesting for us in the Mark Science and Technology Study Group. Yes. You'll need someone who's willing to write a bit of software to, to process it but um, it, yes. it's not difficult software. Okay. So thank you so much for being here with us, Paul. Once again, thank you, Marcus, for being here as well. And uh, we are going, I think, keep discussing a little bit in Portuguese. Okay? Okay, bye. So bye-bye, Paul. Don't. Então, pessoal, uh, acho que a parte inglesa do, do escocesa, na verdade, né? Tipo, de, de Glasgow. Uh, acabou. E aí, uh, se vocês tiverem à vontade, quiserem comentar alguma coisa do debate, acho que é importante né, para quem estiver assistindo e não dominar tanto a língua inglesa, a gente fazer alguns comentários. Né? Uh, acho que deu para perceber aqui, pelos poderia falar que uh, tem duas posições aqui, não necessariamente completamente antagônicas, a do Marcos e a do Paul, né? e que eu percebo que o Marcos, e aí se, você, se eu tiver errado, você me, me comenta, é, ao perceber as contradições na leitura do Capital, principalmente entre o primeiro e o terceiro livro, não é? você, é, Marcos, você parece que prefere selecionar as partes não contraditórias da obra que são ainda relevantes para os nossos dias. Eu fiz essa, um pouco essa análise. E há essa é, digamos, a disposição do Marcos, a disposição o enfrentamento da contradição feito pelo Paul é diferente. É uma, ele, digamos que ele abraçou essa contradição e tentou desenvolvê-la a fim de garantir ainda, digamos, a teoria do valor trabalho a partir da análise de meios computacionais, enfim, de análise de dados. Algumas perguntas que ficaram na minha cabeça e que talvez é, ainda possam ser uh, título de algum debate é por exemplo, uh, um pouco como o Marcos falou, é, como que esses dados acerca da, da, né, da, da, dos trabalhadores, das pessoas envolvidas em determinada indústria, como eles são captados? Isso não é um problema necessariamente do próprio do dado aqui, mas é um problema da, da questão da medição em geral. Né? Como que a gente metrifica a economia e tudo mais? Então, acho que isso é uma das questões. Eu não sei se foi mais ou menos isso que... É adequado para falar da sua... Então, se você puder comentar um pouco essa coisa, seria interessante. 
não é como eu procurei dizer na minha fala, né? eu acho que a posição do Paul Cockshot é bastante original, bastante engenhosa, né? e diferentemente de, digamos, a grande maioria dos marxistas que tentam salvar a teoria do Marx, ele não, não faz como é mais comum, quer dizer, não, a teoria válida, é válida, mas é só num nível muito abstrato de, 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 de análise. Né? É um pouco a visão, a proposta do, do Jorge Crespan, né? que já falou aqui para a gente em outra ocasião. Né? Então, essa é uma, uma vertente assim, que é a mais comum e a do Paul é bem, bem mais original. Ela fala, né? porque, enfim, voltando um pouco atrás, a crítica do Ben Baver, que outros de outros críticos também, é muito fortemente baseada nesse pressuposto de que há essa tendência da taxa de lucro de né, se equalizar, né, de ser a mesma em todos os setores da economia. E o Paul Schott, nisso que ele é original, vai dizer, não, esse pressuposto é que não funciona, e ele pretende, então, dar argumentos, uh, evidências empíricas para isso. Né. Ele, bom, não quis insistir porque ele estava com pouco tempo, né, mas ele não respondeu algumas das minhas questões, né, especialmente essa que eu, lendo os artigos dele, fora os slides que ele tinha mandado antes, né, eu fiquei com essa pergunta. Né, essas input-output tables, o input que entraria o trabalho, né, como é que esse trabalho é medido? Eu perguntei, será que é só pelo salário? Ou, eu, dir, eu diria que se é apenas pelo salário, o, a tese dele pode ser um resultado interessante, mas não como confirmação da teoria do valor trabalho, porque a teoria do valor trabalho você tem que reduzir, no fundo, a medição a horas de trabalho. Se você tem apenas salário, essas horas de trabalho ficam né, indeterminadas. Então, tem um gap aí entre aquilo que ele pretende mostrar e a teoria do valor trabalho, que, em última análise, depende de horas de trabalho envolvidas na produção de mercadorias. Né? Outras duas perguntas que ele não respondeu foi, ah, né, talvez ligada com essa, como é que fica o problema de diferentes trabalhos, trabalho especializado, etc. É né? um problema que surge, tem vários exemplos que são dados, então, sei lá, o exemplo que eu dei, né? o trabalho de um arquiteto vale o mesmo que o trabalho de um pedreiro. É uma questão, enfim... Algumas pessoas podem dizer, não, 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 numa sociedade socialista, todos os trabalhos vão ter o mesmo valor. Pode ser do lixeiro, ou, enfim, dos trabalhos assim, de natureza mais elevada, mais sofisticada, todos uh, têm o mesmo valor, em princípio, devem ser remunerados na mesma taxa. Né? X, no caso aqui, reais por hora de trabalho, independente do, da natureza do trabalho. É uma possibilidade, mas que eu acho que um pouco... Uh, um pouco, um pouco plausível, digamos. Né? Bom, e a outra questão é a seguinte, né? a ideia de que, para o Marx, eu acho que para o Paul também, né? uma das grandes vantagens dessa teoria do valor trabalho é que ela expõe essa relação social injusta dos capitalistas com os trabalhadores, uma relação de exploração. Eu digo, bom, uma crítica análoga pode ser feita sem a teoria do valor trabalho e é a crítica baseada simplesmente na desigualdade, na distribuição de, de renda e de propriedade que o capitalismo estimula. Né? É um tema que está assim, muito em voga nos últimos anos, parece bastante evidente que especialmente o neoliberalismo tem, digamos, contribuído para tornar mais forte essa tendência à desigualdade, também estatísticas que mostram isso, né? E para mim, bom, essa é uma crítica uh, moral também, uma crítica axiológica, né, baseada num um, um princípio de que grandes né, diferenças na distribuição de renda são inaceitáveis, são injustas. Né? Então, com isso, se a gente quiser, a gente pode até falar, bom, essa tendência a promover a desigualdade significa uma exploração, pode-se dizer isso, mas exploração aí é apenas um outro modo de fazer a crítica axiológica que não depende da teoria da exploração do Marx, que inclusive leva 
a índices matemáticos, né? taxa, de, taxa de exploração. Eu acho que bom, uma das vantagens de concentrar o foco na desigualdade é que é um dado muito mais fácil de ser medido do que essa suposta taxa de exploração, que eu acho que se for realmente né, fazer algo assim com medido, quantificado, eu acho que aparecem muitas dificuldades. Né? Então, bom, acho que eu vou parar por aqui, deixar espaço para quem quiser comentar. Então, eu sou o André e professor Marcos, é sobre essa última parte que o senhor falou, que eu já não tinha entendido na, na versão inglesa, então acho que o problema não foi a língua, foi mais a complexidade do tema mesmo, que sou um tanto leigo para isso. Mas, para falar que é, é talvez seja não haja necessidade numa teoria do valor do trabalho, quando a gente pode considerar uma teoria que parece sim, que é muito mais ampla, que é a, a teoria da desigualdade no, no meio social, mas eu não... Então, haveriam vários outros modos de... de injustiça, de modos de distribuição é, desigual, muitos outros modos, e, e inclusive muitos outros e muito mais interessantes e válidos de serem analisados do que aquele que é realizado em meio a, ao ambiente de produção. Porque aí, se sim, aí eu entendo que analisar é, a, a questão é, da desigualdade na sociedade olhando para o pro, pro, pro local de produção dos bens, é, ele seria é, sem, sem, sem sentido. Mas eu não consigo entender quais são esses outros lugares da produção da, produção da desigualdade e, e por que, que a, a, a produção da desigualdade né, no, no ambiente da indústria é, é irrelevante. Acho que é isso, sim, a minha dúvida. Eu não sei se eu entendi bem, mas eu não acho que seja irrelevante. Né? Eu acho que falar em desigualdade, a gente tem que falar do sistema financeiro, por exemplo. Né? As mais altas rendas são rendas de rentistas, de, né? especuladores, a gente diria, de um ponto de vista crítico. Né? Então, tem uma série de, de fatores que vão, digamos, alimentar essa desigualdade. E, Desigualdade, assim, na indústria, digamos, é apenas um componente dessa questão, assim, mais geral. Né? A minha interpretação, repetindo um pouco o que eu falei, né? o objetivo do Marx era pegar um ponto, assim, uh, crucial, né? um, um X do problema, fixar a crítica na exploração, um pouco para dizer que essa é uma dificuldade, um problema do capitalismo que não pode ser resolvido por reformas. É só a superação do capitalismo que vai eliminar. Né? Porque, enfim, como eu falei, na época do Marx existiam muitos críticos do capitalismo. Né? O próprio Marx recorre àqueles relatórios dos inspetores que vão lá nas fábricas e tal. Isso era um produto de uma visão crítica, até independente de qualquer autor, né? uma posição um social que estava percebendo esse tipo de problema do capitalismo. Né? Então, o Marco falou assim, Bom, mas isso aí, como muitas dessas críticas, levava uma reforma. Então, vamos, digamos, estabelecer uma legislação ah, protegendo as crianças do trabalho, então, legislação a respeito do, da jornada de trabalho, etc. Né? Seriam coisas que poderiam melhorar o capitalismo, mas mantendo a sua estrutura básica. É isso que o Marx não queria, né? Por isso que ele Agora, na minha visão é isso, exatamente por ter esse objetivo, o Marx acabou se embananando, né? E desenvolvendo uma teoria que leva assim muitos paradoxos e contradições, né? Então a ideia é essa, né? No fundo, também repetindo, né? Falei, bom, a economia pode funcionar sem uma teoria do valor. Aí mais uma observação, que esse aí é um tipo de estratégia que é muito comum e muito bem sucedida nas ciências naturais. Né? A estratégia de procurar os fatores subjacentes, né? os fatores underlying, 
Então, na física, por exemplo, você tem na teoria dos gases, você tem uma visão macroscópica que trabalha com pressão, volume, temperatura, né? você tem uma, uma termodinâmica e macroscópica. E aí você tem a outra teoria da mecânica estatística que concebe os gases formados por moléculas e tal, e as leis de interação das moléculas e tal. Né? Então, esse nível né? Digamos, atômico da, do estudo dos gases né? é uma espécie de... é o que está subjacente às leis uh, no nível macro. Né? Enfim, poderia dar inúmeros... Um preceito básico assim, né? das ciências naturais é esse, né? procurar o que está, digamos, por trás ou por baixo dos fenômenos observáveis. Então, abstratamente, não teria problema nenhum em falar assim, bom, o problema é explicar os preços, vamos procurar o que está por baixo, por trás desses preços, e esse é o valor. Né? Eu diria que, embora nas ciências naturais essa estratégia dê muito bom resultado, na economia, nas ciências sociais, de maneira geral, a coisa não funciona. Né? Não teria né, não teria motivo a priori para necessariamente funcionar. Né? Agora, isso, né, que as questões que eu pus, bom, a economia, como é que a gente deve conceber a economia, quais são os seus princípios metodológicos, epistemológicos, etc. Né? O que, é que se espera da, da, da ciência econômica? Né? Esses são problemas que eu, não tendo formação em economia, eu posso, não posso me estender muito. Né? Por isso que eu resumi o meu argumento é o seguinte, ó, um bom exemplo de um trabalho em economia que não se baseia em nenhuma teoria do valor. Um trabalho do Carlos Polano, né? pelo qual eu tenho grande admiração. Mais alguém? Bom, acho que é isso então por hoje. Né? Gostaria de agradecer o Marcos, agradecer vocês por estarem aqui nessa discussão. Lembrar que, é, é, como eu falei no início da palestra, essa é a segunda vez que nós estamos fazendo um evento em inglês. A primeira vez vocês podem também acessar no site do IEA, era sobre o cálculo socialista, o planejamento econômico soviético. Uh, foi no ano passado. Também foi uma interessante discussão e nós vamos ter ainda mais um debate esse semestre, dia 5 de junho, que estamos para confirmar aí, que é uma discussão mais para é, saber um pouco do que, que significa essa vertente do, das discussões sobre socialismo chamado ecossocialismo. É, e nós vamos ver as implicações, as pessoas que defendem, as que não defendem. E é isso. Então, muito obrigado. Valeu, Marcos. Obrigado, Orlando. Obrigado a todos vocês e até a próxima. <risos>